Today we're having a look at the OneMix 3S Yoga. And this is a small laptop from a company called One Netbook in China. And it's a very small Core M laptop. And we're gonna have a look inside. Um, I'm gonna open it up and we'll see how far it can get. And I'll show you guys the interior and I'll try to share some of my thoughts. So uh, with that said, let's dive right in. Let me adjust the camera. Let's make sure that's uh, good. Okay, let's get started. We will begin the teardown with a Phillips screwdriver and there are six screws along the bottom casing and we'll just take those out and hopefully it should open right up. The bottom panel lifts off with no other tools required. And we have access to the internal layout of the OneMix 3S Yoga. Inside we have a lithium ion battery pack, battery pack connector, internal speaker, fan, and thermal solution. The CPU thermal solution covers both the system on chip and the voltage regulation components. Um, presumably under here. We'll open all that up and have a look in a moment. Notably in the 3S version, which is the version with the 16 gigabytes of memory and 512 gigabyte solid state drive, the speaker has been moved from the bottom area to the area next to the fan. <clears throat> As we can see on the bottom cover, there are two apertures for the speakers However, they are unused in this model. On the regular three version, the silver edition, the speaker, which is here, will be placed over here next to the battery. And this extension of the motherboard is not present on the three version. So that is something to keep in mind. Um, with that said, let's keep going. So the first thing that looks like will come out will probably be the speaker, uh, given that's right up there. So let's take a spudger. And I should probably disconnect the battery at some point. Uh, let's do that before we disconnect anything. The speaker, uh, speaker doesn't look like it's screwed in. Let's uh, carefully try to remove it. So the speaker is not fixed very hard. It needs to be fastened to the flex cable. Uh, we may leave that for later. Let's start with the fan instead. So now it's probably a good time to unplug the battery. Um, do note that there is no support for the motherboard underneath the battery connector, so be very careful with that to avoid damage to the motherboard, or logic board as we'll call it in Apple speak. We need another screwdriver tip. The screws that hold the fan in are quite large, actually. They are still Phillips screws, standard. Can easily be removed. Looks like a total of two screws hold the fan in. And the fan can easily be peeled away from the... There. So inside we can see the fan and I'll give you a close up. The fan is in Avid Thermaloy. And these are generally decent quality fans, although depending on what type of bearing is employed, which is very likely to be a fluid dynamic bearing based on the behavior of the fan as it coasts to a stop there, um, which may require oiling in the future. We will have a closer look to the fan, at the fan, once uh, we're able to remove it. Uh, we may have better luck doing so following removing the heat sink, which looks like the easiest component to remove. Continuing on with the Phillips head screwdriver, we will extract the screws for the heatsink, which are different from the screws for the bottom case in the fan, and continue to work our way inside the device. 
the power is disconnected, so I shouldn't worry too much about dropping the screws. There's quite a lot of tape used inside this device to hold everything together, which is quite, um, which is nice. Nice to see that they're making sure nothing's going to move around, as this is a mobile device. With that sticker removed, we may be able to simply lift the heatsink assembly. It appears to be a little bit stuck, so we'll try to wiggle that loose. Oh, there we go. Heatsink is stuck quite um, firmly. You want to be careful because this is very thin. This is very thin material, so you don't want to pull on these um, radiator components very hard at all um, to avoid bending the assembly more than necessary. With that, it looks like... Oh, I've missed the screw. There we go. So, as you probably can notice, this is the first time I've disassembled this device, so... Here we go. Um, here we can see the inside of the heatsink, and... Having a quick look, this is all copper, so this is a very thin plate of copper, as I previously mentioned, and you want to be very careful to avoid bending it, because if the copper plate does become bent, um, the thermal contact between the processor and the heatsink will be compromised, and this will result in worse thermals. The heat pipes themselves are quite thin. If we can grab the calipers, if, um, the heat pipe is 0 0.75 millimeters thick, and the other one is probably the same. The copper sheet is about 0 0.5 millimeters thick. So that's a fairly thin um, thermal assembly. So you'll, you'll want to be careful with that uh, while handling. It looks like the top of the thermal assembly has been painted, uh, painted black. That is not anodization. And on the back, we have what looks like um, plastic. It is foam, um, likely to protect the battery from excessive heat, though the heatsink will result in elevated battery temperatures due to the placement. So you will want to keep that in mind. Um, so it's kind of already a little bit bent out of shape. We'll have to fix that before we put it back together. It is really a thin and fragile cooling system, but an effective one. Uh, with a default thermal paste, which is quite uh, excessive, it still only gets up to about 73 degrees Celsius under about 14 watts of load. The fan does come apart, I believe. Actually, let's uh, have a quick look at that. The black metal plate on top of the fan, and... Here you go, we've got the fan blades. <coughs> the fan has an, an interesting shape to it. And it comes apart. Okay, so this one comes apart for oiling. So if the fan should require service in the future, um, it is serviceable. Inside we have a fairly standard four pole DC brushless motor. However, this fan is rather loud. Um, the motor is rather loud. The air airflow does not create um, that much sound. It is mostly from the cogging, the cogging torque, or rather the commutation of the motor. So that's quite unfortunate, but it is a nice little fan, I'd say. It spins quite freely. It's... Um, solid little unit, and it's nice to see that they're using a fan again from a company called Avid Thermaloy, as opposed to a cheaper model. So, uh, what should we go to next? Let's try to get the motherboard out. So the motherboard is quite, um, quite small. It takes up uh, only about that much of the device. And if we look here, we're looking at about... 11 centimeters wide. So that's a very small um, size to fit all this logic in. And keep in mind, there
there are 16 gigabytes of memory as well as the Wi-Fi and the SSD on the board. <coughs> so there is a plastic shield covering the board and um, I suppose that is what we will attack next. Be careful because um, this plastic shield exists to protect the board from shorting on the copper heat heat sink assembly, the thermal thermal solution. So um, we will need to reuse this sticker or replace it with Kapton tape or any other suitable insulating polyamide tape. We have carefully removed that. And let's open the FFC connector. This one goes to the screen, one of the screen cables. Likely the touch, because this looks like the main display connector. So these are flat flex connectors. And this screen cable is not a flat flex. The screen cable is wires. So likely under here um, turns into wires and this part, I believe, should be replaceable. The most difficult, <coughs> um, the most difficult part of the repair is likely going to be getting the display apart, <coughs> which we are probably not going to do today, as it is likely to be a destructive operation, unfortunately. Um, so I'm not sure about repair part availability, and I will definitely update when I find out more. The motherboard is held in with some nice and small screws, and they are the same as the ones used for the heatsink or thermal assembly. So that should simplify reassembly. It looks like uh, we should free up the antenna connections for the wireless, and of course, a very small, fragile ribbon cable. With the Wi-Fi disconnected, we need to disconnect the I.O. board flex. And that is what was stopping us from getting at the speaker earlier. We'll lift up on that tab and remove that. <coughs> and this is likely the keyboard flex, and that is quite hard to access without removing the battery. Fortunately, fortunately it's flip up and not uh, push out, so can the battery be removed? That's a good question. Now would be a good time to find out. Apparently, yes, the battery is not glued very strongly into the casing. With that said, there are flex cables underneath it stuck in the glue, so you do need to be very careful um, with the battery in general in the area. But that might give us the small amount of flexibility we need to take that board out. Likely the USB-A connector is what's stopping us. That was a lucky guess. Yes, so we will push up on the USB-A connector and carefully free the motherboard, making sure all the flat flex connections have been disconnected. Definitely, I believe the battery should come out first if you were to attempt this yourself. This is for the keyboard backlight. Oh, and there's another connector underneath it. So definitely, yes, the battery needs to come out first. Let's get a closer look at the motherboard and I'll bring the motherboard back later on. Let's set that aside. The battery now should be able to come out fairly easily. It is not glued very heavily. I'm going to carefully, no heat required, this, uh, this assembly is being attempted at room temperature. I've broken something. Yes, I feel like I have. So the battery is very lightly adhered to the to the back of the keyboard backlight. So this is why you need to be very careful in removing it. Very fortunately, the battery is glued very lightly and can be removed at room temperature with no tools. That is a huge plus. Um, we will have a closer look at the battery, similarly to the main board later on. Set that aside. And 
I was right about that being the keyboard backlight. As we can see under here, this is the layer that handles keyboard backlighting, and that's the keyboard switches. Uh, fortunately, um, this is not a LCD backlight. It is unlikely to have been significantly damaged during that uh, battery removal. So let's uh, quickly tuck the components back in. This is a foam stopper, not a speaker, not a tweeter. Um, in some of the photos, it sort of looked like this was a ribbon cable going from this IO board over here. I couldn't tell if it was a tweeter. It doesn't look like that is the case. This is a foam block. And this looks like that is the top of the casing. Yep, that's metal. It is finished uh, quite well inside. It's a very nice finish. So that would be the keyboard. Um, this is the actually this is the optical mouse connection that's under the main under the battery. So definitely take the battery out first before attempting to remove the motherboard. Um, I guess the speaker comes out next. Now, of course, I'm being very wordy here. Um, this is the first time I've opened this, and to be completely honest, I'm not 100% sure what I'm doing, so uh, bear with me here. Feel free to skip ahead, of course, as always, with all my same, yes, these screws are all the same. With the IO board removed, the screws removed, the speaker should come out with the flex cable and the IO board. Is the speaker glued or mounted? That is quite likely. The speaker is actually mounted quite solidly despite being in there sort of wonkily. Oh, okay, it's a peg. Okay. So that uh, that's a speaker and the IO board. I don't see a need to actually remove the flex from the speaker, and I'll avoid doing that to avoid possible damage. Very importantly to note, the IO board is not the same as the IO board in the One Mix 3, so unfortunately it will not be possible to simply solder on a M2 SSD connector. In the One Mix 3, the regular version, the speaker sits in this location right here. Um, I'm still unsure if that's actually the same speaker that was used in the One Mix 3 versus the 3S. Does the speaker placement effect sound? Yes, it does. Quite um, significantly. The sound does become quite hollow and muffled when the speaker is inside the device. It comes out the bottom and the sound changes when the device is placed on a surface or not. Fortunately, the sound is still perfectly usable with a little bit of vibration um, and some equalization, hopefully, will mitigate most of the issues. The speaker itself is of pretty good quality and it's quite large. Let's do a quick measurement. It's about five centimeters by one and a half. Does sound, I would say, as good after EQ as in about an iPhone 6S, or... And I'm not sure, that's the fingerprint scanner. I'm probably not gonna take that out because that doesn't look very interesting. That's the display hinges. Just a couple screws. I kinda would've liked it if they made that a little bigger, but I'll let it pass. That's a very similar design to what we see in a MacBook. Definitely plenty of screw coverage here. Um, I don't anticipate that should be a problem. Light scratches, no real damage. Screwdriver. Light scratches. Utility knife. That does really well on the scratch test. Actually, um, well, it did, it's, it did get scratched, but that was from most of the scratches are actually from the knife. 
and I had to press quite hard on that to get that to do that when I when I just lightly grazed it. Um, okay, well there's definitely some scratches. Okay, so the keyboard appears to be removable. There's some very small screws located on the keyboard, and that's that's the optical touch mouse. Um, interestingly enough, it has a click. So the optical touch mouse actually has a button. That's neat. It's got a button. It's tactile. I'm not sure what it does. Uh, in fact, let's open the laptop and see if that clicks. No, I believe there is nothing over that to catch that click. So, so that's interesting. That's um. That looks like actually it's an off-the-shelf part. Perhaps um, it might be changeable. But the keyboard does appear to be metal-backed and can be removed. The one thing to note is the keyboard backlight is connected here. The backlight is mostly a con contagious sheet of plastic, but if tea or water is to be spilled into the keyboard, especially near the mouse keys, it will enter the device. Uh, fortunately, there is nothing except for the battery at the bottom. So there's some hope for the device not being damaged. Let's quickly go over the battery of the computer. It is a 7.7 volts or 8.8 volts. Uh, normally they're 8.4 volts um, battery pack. So there are two cells, which means they are in series. There, in the middle, there is a small PCB for the battery management system and that will allow the battery, this is a smart battery, so the computer will be able to tell, will be able to ask this controller for information about the battery. The one thing that concerns me about this design, while the thermal solution performs quite well, I'm wondering how hot the plate here gets. In the future video, the um, where I do some more performance testing, I will definitely measure that but elevated temperatures will cause the battery to degrade um, a little faster than usual. And the battery is rated at about 33.11 uh, watt hours, which is quite significant. It's um, not a small battery considering how small the cells are, but I'm not sure whether these are the 1000 cell, uh, 1000 cycle rated batteries. So, um, I assume there's no easy way to find that out, and your battery may last longer or shorter, but it would be nice to keep this battery cool whenever possible, and that will help to prolong the life of the battery. I will test whether the computer will boot with the battery disconnected. Let's take a closer look at the boards. So let's have a look first at this very interesting tidbit. When this device was first released, um, they said that this would not come with SIM card support, nor, um, nor LTE, of course. Now, what's very interesting is though this device lacks the M2 slot that would be required to use LTE, very curiously, there's a slot on the IO board um, let's see, let's see if we can find that label. Let's zoom in. It looks like we do have, after all, a SIM card slot. It says SIM1, and there's no uh, tray. And this is actually in a, this is on the I.O. board, so this is in a, in a consistent location with where the SIM, external SIM tray was on the casing of the prototype picture that was circulated. Um, actually, you know, what, what's very interesting is um, if someone with the three could check inside and see if they have that slot there, because that could actually make LTE viable on um, the three, because that has an M2 slot. Let's go on a quick tour of the motherboard. I will put up a nice high resolution picture of this um, in the video as well, but let's just go over it quickly. Here we have the memory, the 8100Y system on chip. This is the 4C 512 gigabyte soldered micro PCIe NAND SSD. 
Um, that's the Intel 3180-something Wi-Fi chip. Uh, that's a module. That's a Wi-Fi module uh, soldered to the board, so you can't change it. There's the serial flash, so we can definitely clip something on there or unsolder that to recover the BIOS should something go wrong. That's the ITE chip. That's a keyboard controller as well as the system management. Well, it's not called a system management controller on Windows. It's called a embedded controller. That's a microcontroller that controls the fan speed and the system power. It's a battery. Looks like some primary uh, power conversion or charging for the battery. Probably it's probably a fat. Um, actually, no. It's probably an integrated converter with the small 2 micro henry 2.2 micro henry uh inductor over here we have some main power switching going on probably for the type c and the cpu power supply is over here so actually um let's see uh if we wanted to thermal pad the cpu power regulators where'd we go if we wanted to do that, we'd probably want to put thermal pads here. That's probably where we'd want to put them instead of here, but we'll probably also want to do those as well. Those are for the main system, and that's for the processor. You can see we've got these big caps. Those are for the processor, and these are probably the FETs for the processor. On the back side of the board, we have a pretty simple... The keyboard backlight connector is here with the associated driver. We have the main, this is the touch mouse connector. SD card, some FETs. It's an intercell chip, so it's probably for power management, another FET. So, um, you know, they've got the USB, some lights. These aren't very bright, which is a very good thing. Not very much to see on the back. Mostly, yeah. We have the SD card controller here, I think. And that's about it for the uh, motherboard, actually. On the I.O. board, we have the microphone. I haven't tested that yet. We'll get into that later. Um, HDMI, that's on the I.O. board. So... This is definitely going to be um, swappable, should that break. Headphone jack, this board is swappable. And that's a SIM card, which is fortunately unused. The other side, we have the flat flex. Uh, we'll do a close up on this board as well, in case someone wants to see if we can uh, swap these. That chip is a that's a Realtek audio chip, so that's an audio codec, and that's a speaker connected right there. No dedicated amplifier, that's the amplifier. The sound is actually quite loud, uh, considering there's no amplifier. Anyway, that's, a, that's about it for the quick tour. I'll, again, I'll put up the big picture of this, and I will label the chips so that you can have a closer look at your convenience. So I guess that concludes. Uh, thank you very much for watching today, and I hope to make uh, further videos about this device later on. Goodbye.